New Intermediate Market Leader, Course Book, Third Edition, by David Cotton, David Falvey, and Simon Kent, published by Pearson Longman, Copyright Pearson Education, 2010. Unit One, Brands, Track One. Do you buy brands? Yes, I do. I am basically pro brands. If you buy a branded product, it's a guarantee that the quality is fairly good, and that the product is reliable. Another reason is you attract a bit of attention. If you buy something stylish, and branded products are usually stylish and have a good design. Let's face it: most people buy brands because they want to impress other people. They want to show that they have style and good taste. Do you buy brands? No. Well, not actively, anyway. I don't want to give free advertising to companies. I hate all the advertising hype around brands, and I don't want other people to think I'm trying to impress them with lots of logos. <laughs> and I also get fed up with seeing the same things wherever you go. If you buy a suit from a famous brand, you'll see five people with the same suit that month. It's so boring. <laughs> Oh, another thing. Am I buying the genuine product or an illegal copy? Basically, I want value for money. I won't pay inflated prices for a name, a fancy logo, and packaging. However, I do buy brands for my kids, especially sports goods and trainers. It's always Nike, Adidas, or Reebok. Unit one, brands. Track two. What are the qualities of a really good brand? Strong brands, really, you know, brands that you would say have a, a real traction in the marketplace,、um, will have a number of important qualities. Obviously, the first is they will have high levels of awareness, so people will know about them and recognise them when they see them, and that might be the physical product or it might be the visual identity, the, the design manifestation.、Um, but obviously, recognition is not enough. What needs to happen also is that people,、uh, you know, the, the target customer or consumer needs to know. A lot about that brand. So, a strong brand will also immediately communicate a set of appealing and persuasive ideas、uh, and perceptions that enable the end user,、uh, you know, the target audience, to know whether or not this is a brand for them,、um, or whether it's a brand that they perhaps are not attracted to. Unit one. Brands, track three. Brands are really useful ways of, firstly, conveying all that information instantly. So, think of any brand you like, any brand that you could imagine, say BMW or British Airways or in any sector, and immediately your head is filled with、uh, a raft of important information about what the brand does. But as much as Uh, that what it's like and and how it appeals to you and connects with you, and so it, its function therefore is to enable you to choose one thing from another. Often in markets where there is very little actual difference between, you know, the the, the product. So a BMW, I'm sure a BMW would probably be horrified for me to say this, but. You know, a BMW is a car like an Audi is a car like a Mercedes is a car, and they've all got four wheels and an engine and you know air conditioning and all that type of thing. But the way people feel about them because of the information and awareness and perception that they have enables them to decide whether or not one is better for them or right for them or says the right things about them than another. Unit One, Brands, Track Four. Can you give us an example of a brand you have helped? One that I can think of is Nokia. Nokia is, you know, a well-known brand.、Um, it, it is by far the biggest mobile phone manufacturer. 
I think it has about a third of the market, so it's way bigger than anybody else. It's also been um, in the market, it was kind of invented the market in a way. So for many people, particularly people of my generation, Nokia equals mobile phones. We've helped them in a couple of important ways. Firstly, um, in a market that's changed and a brand that's expanded hugely in terms of what it offers, we help them with uh, the question of what is it that Nokia is about and how does it relate to its customers, its broad range of customers, in ways in which its competitors don't. So to give it that uh, um, element of choice, you know, so why I should choose a Nokia over a Motorola um, in addition to what it looks like and what it does, so what the brand is about. Um, so that on the, what you might call technically the master brand. And we've also helped them with um, developing certain parts of their offer in order to um, react to the market and also to keep the brand fresh. So we worked with Nokia on their N series, which is one of their more technological phones, multimedia phones though they don't like to call them phones anymore because they do so much more, um, in order to satisfy uh, the needs that that emerging customer group has, primarily younger consumers who want to be able to do all sorts of things with their phones or devices, um, but also in order to sharpen Nokia's brand image as a technology leader. It was important that it had products in, in those areas. Unit 1. Brands. Track 5. Joy, we know our client doesn't want to be linked to football anymore. It seems the club they sponsor is asking for too much money. And in any case, they're looking for something more exciting. Something that'll give their brand a bit more punch. Any ideas? Well, there are several possibilities. How about ice hockey? Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly fast, exciting sport. It's very popular in America mm. and in a lot of European countries. Okay, that's a possibility. What do you think, Natasha? Would ice hockey be a good choice? Mm, I'm not so sure. It's not really an international sport, is it? Mm -hmm. Not in the same way as baseball, for example, or tennis. That's true. Baseball's got a lot more international appeal and... It's a sport that's got a good image. I don't know about tennis. I'm not sure it would be suitable. Mario, how do you feel about this? <laughs> In my opinion, motor racing would be perfect for our client. It's fast, exciting, and the TV coverage of the Formula One races is excellent. Hmm. They would get a lot of exposure. It will really strengthen their image. That's a great idea, Mario. Why don't we get in touch with Larry Harrington's agency and see if he's interested? Harrington's young, exciting. He'd probably jump at the chance to work with our client. They're a perfect match. But first, I must check with our client and make sure they're happy with our choice. Unit 1. Brands. Track 6. Okay, everyone. We'll be getting a report soon from the consultants we've hired, European marketing. But let's think a bit about the problems we may face entering the European markets. Diana, what do you think? Well, one thing's for sure. We're going to have to do a lot of advertising to establish our brand, and that's going to be expensive. Uh -huh. And we may need to adapt a lot of our luggage for European consumers that could be very costly, too. Yes, but we've allowed for that in our budget. Ruth, what difficulties do you think we'll have? Well, we'll need to get the pricing of our products right. But European consumers aren't as price conscious as we are back home, so pricing may not be too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact people in Europe will pay high prices for luxury goods if they like the design and it gives them status. Hmm. So I think we have to develop the Hudson brand as an exclusive Made in America product. That'll mean high prices and a strong message that our luggage is high quality and great value for money. Hmm. 
That makes sense to me. Tom, what do you think? I don't agree at all. I just don't think Ruth's right. Hmm. I think we should go down market, sell at very competitive prices, and aim to achieve high volume sales. Mm -hmm. To do that, we'll need to look carefully at our manufacturing costs. So it's probably time we stopped manufacturing in the U.S. The costs are just too high. Thanks, Tom. That's an interesting point of view. I think we all feel that we need to position Hudson right in European markets. Should we go up market or down market? That's an important decision we'll have to make. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. My feeling, too, is we may need to increase the range of our products and stretch our brand. Put it on other products. The right products, of course. Ones that fit with our brand image. We certainly need some new thinking if we're going to succeed in Europe. And our consultants, European Marketing, will have plenty of advice for us, I've no doubt. Unit 2. Travel. Track 7. 1. What I really don't like is the way airlines treat people on the plane. There are far too many seats on most planes, so there's not enough legroom, and I'm not even particularly tall. I always try and get the seats near the emergency exit for that reason. You get much more room. Also, the poor quality food and drink you get on airlines annoys me. It's all so processed and packaged. I just can't eat it. I prefer trains. 2. I like flying, but I really don't enjoy being at airports. Things like long queues at check-in irritate me. Also, when I have a lot of luggage and there are no baggage trolleys around, it's really inconvenient. What's even more frustrating is when I do find a trolley and then see that the departure board is full of flight delays and cancellations. 3. I must be really unlucky because it seems I'm always a victim of lost or delayed luggage. It usually turns up, but never with an apology. I don't like the attitude of the airlines, and I'm sorry they're all the same. They seem to treat passengers like just another piece of luggage to be moved around the world. They seem to forget that we're people. For example, they overbook seats and just expect people to be able to get the next flight if their flight is full. What I really hate, though, is jet lag. It's a big problem for me, as I travel a lot to the Far East on business. Unit 2. Travel. Track 8. My last overseas business trip was a nightmare from start to finish. First of all, there was a delay on the way to the airport as there was an accident on the freeway. When I got there, I found the lower level of the airport parking lot was flooded. Next, my carry-on baggage was too big and heavy, so I had to check it in. When we arrived, the subway was closed and there were no cabs at all. After a long time trying to figure out the schedule and waiting in line for 40 minutes, we finally got a bus downtown and found the hotel. Then there was a problem with our room reservation. And, would you believe it, the elevator wasn't working and our rooms were on the fifth floor. Unit 2. Travel. Track 9. What are the main needs of business travellers and how do your hotels meet them? A key point would be the location of our hotels, um, good links with um, subway underground networks close to the airport um, and obviously close to an office that the guest would be working in while they're staying in the hotel. Um, technology is also a key feature and nowadays is expected because obviously people have um, great technology at home and therefore if it's also available in a hotel that's also um, a, a key feature. Um, internet, a business center, um, obviously translation services and that kind of um, facility is also is paramount and guests also expect an area where they can uh, go to a gymnasium, they can exercise um, and also that, that kind of thing. These would be the key features.
Unit 2. Travel. Track 10. And how have rising travel costs affected the hotel business? Uh, they have affected business, but it's made the hotels more savvy in that they are being more competitive and looking at ways of um, adding value uh, to the guest stay. And that can take in anything from um, including breakfast um, on a daily basis, membership to, to, the, to the health club, uh, including newspapers or possibly looking at um, you know, transportation to and from the airport, a shuttle service to the local department store, a shuttle service to, to the offices in which the client um, works in, um, and that kind of um, um, value-add benefit, as opposed to just directly dropping the rate, which really doesn't benefit either party. Unit 2. Travel. Track 11. What future developments do you foresee in the business travel market? Future developments in the business travel market, I think technology is still a hot topic, as is um, the, the obviously environmental policies, because that really is, um, is obviously, it's, it's a still a buzzword, so to speak. We, we went through um, healthy eating, uh, we've gone through gymnasiums in hotels and the likes and now really there's such a huge focus on um, on the likes of the environment so whether it be water conservation, low energy lighting in bedrooms um, and the likes thereof, that, that kind of thing. Um, but obviously it's, it's high speed internet, it's television on demand, it's um, lower cost telephone calls from the rooms because obviously people now travel with BlackBerry and with, with mobile phones so they're not actually having to use hotel telephone services um, and these are the ways forward for hotels. Unit 2. Travel. Track 12. Good morning. The Fashion House. How can I help you? This is Jennifer North here. Could you put me through to extension 4891, please? Certainly. Putting you through now. Hello, Christina Verdi speaking. Hello, Christina. It's Jennifer North from Madison in New York. Hi, Jennifer. How are things? Fine, thanks. I'm calling because I'll be in London next week, and I'd like to make an appointment to see you. I want to tell you about our new collection. Great! What day would suit you? I'm fairly free next week, I think. How about Wednesday in the afternoon? Could you make it then? Let me look now. Uh, let me check the diary. Uh, yes, that'd be no problem at all. Uh, what about two o'clock? Is that okay? Perfect. Thanks very much. It'll be great to see you again. We'll have plenty to talk about. <laughs> That's for sure. See you next week, then. Right. Bye. Bye, then. Unit 2. Travel. Track 13. Good morning. The Fashion House. How may I help you? I'd like to speak to Christina Verdi, extension 4891, please. Thank you. Who's calling, please? It's Jennifer North from Madison. Thank you. I'm putting you through. Hello. I'm afraid she's engaged at the moment. Will you hold, or can I put you through to her voicemail? Um, would you be able to take a message for me, please? I'm in a bit of a hurry. Yes, certainly. The thing is, I should be meeting Ms. Verdi at uh, 2 p.m., but something's come up. My plane was delayed, and I've got to reschedule my appointments. If possible, I'd like to meet her tomorrow, preferably in the morning. Could she call me back here at the hotel, please, to confirm? Certainly. What's the number? It's 020-7855-2. Three eight one four, and I'm in room uh, six eleven. I'll be leaving the hotel soon, so if she can't call me back within the next half an hour, uh, I'll call her again this morning. Is that okay? Right, I've got that. I'll make sure she gets the message. Thanks for your help. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. 
Unit Three, Change, Track Fourteen. How do you advise businesses which are planning to change? The two important things to take into account when advising businesses is, first of all, help them understand what does success look like. What are they going to change? How are they going to measure that change? And how will they know they've been successful? And I think the second key point is to make sure people are fully engaged in the change, that they feel this is something they are doing for themselves and not something which is being done to them. Unit three, change, track fifteen. What are the typical problems that businesses face when they're going through change? Change is a very difficult process. There are many problems, but I would say the two, perhaps most important ones, are first of all what we think of as change fatigue. Organisations have often faced wave after wave of change, program after program. Organisations become very cynical about programmes' ability to deliver real change and change that's sustained over time. So it can be very hard to bring people along and create passion, enthusiasm around change when they've seen it again and again. And the second big area that I see is the ability to get leaders engaged and aligned around the change, so that leadership speaks with one voice. Leadership provides a role model for the organisation, and very importantly, helps the organisation stay focused on the change throughout what is sometimes a long and difficult process. Unit three, change, track sixteen. Can you give us an example of an organisation that you have helped to change? We work with a wide range of organisations around the world. One we helped recently was Nokia and Siemens when they merged their networks business, and that was a very exciting change program at a time of trying to create better value for the organisation. We helped NSN create a future for the organisation. So we had eight thousand people involved around the world in a conversation over seventy-two hours, in which they constructed the values. Of the future organisation, and following that, then put changes in place that would make that future organisation a reality for them. Unit three, change, track seventeen. Good morning, everyone. I take it you've received the agenda and the minutes of our last meeting. Does anyone have any comments? Hmm. Uh, no. <laughs> right. The purpose of this meeting is to discuss our smoking policy. As you know,、uh, people are complaining that our staff have been smoking just outside the door of the building, and leaving cigarette ends everywhere on the pavement. That's not acceptable. Eduardo, you are a smoker. What do you think we should do about it? Well. I think we should be able to smoke outside the restaurant on the balcony. It's big enough for plenty of people to sit there. It's in the open air, and <laughs> we smokers would be happy. We wouldn't bother to go outside the building. Hmm, interesting. How do you feel about that, Misuko? Do you agree with Eduardo? Not at all. Our policy has always been no smoking on company premises. I think we should keep it that way. Non-smoking staff often go out on the balcony to relax. They don't want to breathe in a lot of filthy smoke. No, it's not at all. Well, come on, Mitsuko. I'm not a smoker, but I do think you should be a little more open-minded, more tolerant. I'm sorry, William. What do you say is very interesting. I'm sure, but could you let Mitsuko finish, please? You get your turn to give your opinion. Sorry for interrupting you, Mitsuko. Please go on. I just wanted to say, I don't think we should provide places in the building for people to smoke. It's setting a bad example, especially to younger staff. William, what do you want to say? I just think we have to try to understand smokers. They're addicted to smoking. They find it very hard to give up. So we should provide them with somewhere to enjoy their habit, 
Or, if we can't do that, give them a longer break during the morning, say at 11 o'clock, so they can go to the park near here and have a cigarette. I think that's a good idea, Petra. It would show smokers that we want to help them. Uh, you know, that we're a tolerant, open-minded company. Not a bad idea. It's definitely worth considering, too. But I think we should move on now. Can we come back to the smoking issue at our next meeting? I want to get the opinion of staff about our smoking policy, so they will be getting a questionnaire about it from our HR department sometime in the next few days. OK, everyone, thanks for your comments. To sum up, then, on the smoking policy, we will consider whether we want to give smokers a longer break in the morning. And we'll discuss the matter again at next week's meeting. OK, any other business? Right. Thanks, everyone, for your contributions. Have a good lunch. Unit 3. Change. Track 18. First of all, Mr. Hennison, what was your main reason for the acquisition? Well, it'll benefit our group in many ways. Obviously, we expect the deal to boost our earnings. It's bound to be good for our bottom line. Not immediately, but uh, the year after next, we're hoping... Hold on. It sounds to me, from what you're saying, it would be bad for your bottom line, wouldn't it? Look, like all acquisitions, the reorganisation will involve additional costs. So these will affect earnings in the early stages. All mergers are costly at the beginning. Hmm, I suppose there'll be savings as well. What exactly do you mean? Well, savings in terms of personnel, staff cuts, redundancies... I'd rather not comment on that, if you don't mind. We're in the early stages at present. Nothing's been decided yet. So what are the synergies? What are the main benefits, apart from boosting earnings in the long run? Well, we plan to expand the TV channels, offer more variety and sell more entertainment products. Also, we'll import a lot of Australian films for Asian audiences. I want to make our new group a strong force in Asia. I see. Are you worried about the cultural differences between the two organisations? Not really. There'll be some initial problems, no doubt, but our managers have an understanding of Chinese culture, and don't forget, I'm a fluent Mandarin speaker. But of course, the working language in the group will continue to be English. Right. Thanks very much, Mr. Hennison. I hope your company will be very successful in the future. Thank you. Working across cultures. 1. Socialising. Track 19. Hi, I'm Antonio Silva. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you too. I'm James Whitfield. Call me James. Where are you from, James? I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. How about you? I've come a long way. I'm from Belo Horizonte in Brazil. I'm sales manager for an office equipment group, Teco. Maybe you know us? Yeah, I've certainly heard of your company. I work for New Era in New York. I'm a systems analyst. Right. How is business going for you? Is it a bit tough, like for most people? No, not so far. Actually, our sales were up last quarter. But it's early days, I suppose. To be honest, we're all worried about the future. No doubt about that. How about your company? Things are not too good at all. Uh -huh. We've had quite a few redundancies lately. All departments have been told to cut costs this year. Mm. It's not going to be easy, but we've got to do it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound too good. No, but these are difficult times for everyone. How was your journey here? I suppose you came by air, did you? Yeah, it was quite a long flight. A bit turbulent at times, but the food and service were okay. So I'm not complaining. How about your journey? Pretty exhausting. But I stopped over at Los Angeles and did some business there. So I did get a rest before coming here. Are you staying at this hotel? 
Actually, I'm not. I'm lucky. I'm staying with my daughter. She lives downtown, not far from here. And she insisted I stayed with her. It's fine by me. She's a fantastic cook. Whoa, you're lucky. I'm staying in a pretty cheap hotel a few blocks away to cut costs. And I'm not at all happy. How's that? Well, the room's very small. And the hotel doesn't have many facilities. Hmm. It would be nice if there was a pool or gym so I could have a workout. I couldn't use their business center yesterday. Apparently, there was no one to run it. It was really annoying. Maybe you should change your hotel. I don't think I'll bother. The main thing is the conference. If the speakers are good, I can't put up with a bit of inconvenience at the hotel. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. We all want to enjoy the conference and listen to some good speakers. Working across cultures. 1. Socializing. Track 20. Hi, Klaus. Please join us. There's plenty of room. Thanks. We'd love to. I don't think we have met. Let me do the introductions. I'm James Whitfield, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a systems analyst for New Era. This is Antonio Silva from Brazil. He's a sales manager with an office equipment firm. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. I'm Klaus Liebermann. I'm a colleague of James's. I'm the managing director of New Era's Frankfurt subsidiary. And this is Ludmila Poigina from St. Petersburg. She's a director of an engineering company. How do you do? And this is Nancy Chen from Beijing. She's a senior official in the Chinese Department of Environment. How do you do? So, have any of you had time to visit the city yet? I suppose you want to explore it a bit. Well, I'd love to. I've never been to Seattle, and I've heard a lot of good things about it, but I just don't have the time. I'm only here for two days, and I want to go to as many talks as possible. That's not much time, but you should try to see a few of the sites here, like the famous Space Needle. It's a real landmark, and if you go to the market area, you can see where the first Starbucks store was located back in the early 1970s. Okay. Well, I might try to sneak away for a few hours if possible. What about you, Ludmilla? Are you going to check out the local area? Actually, I've already done that. I came here early so I could look around a bit. I've seen the Space Needle and visited the Civic Center. I was really impressed with the Columbia Center. It's a massive skyscraper, much bigger than the ones I saw in New York. What about the conference? Anyone special you want to see, Antonio? I'll definitely go to Mark Carlson's talk. He's always worth listening to. I don't know much about the other speakers, though. Can anyone recommend a good speaker? Well, I've registered to go to David Brodus's presentation. He's written a lot of books on information systems. I think he'll be the star of the conference. He's a very stimulating speaker. Mm, yes, I can confirm that. I went to one of his talks in Munich last year, and the questions afterwards went on for over half an hour. He went down really well with the audience because he was obviously so knowledgeable about his topic. Yes, I want to go to his talk too, if it's not already booked up. Another good speaker is Jerry Chin. He's an expert on management software. He's another speaker who shouldn't be missed. Unit 4. Organization. Track 21. 1. Stock levels have been low for two weeks now. 2. Why do we always have to check with the parent company before making decisions. 3. Yes, that's fine. If you could just hold on a minute. 
I'll need to transfer you to a supervisor. 4. We need to deliver this consignment on Friday. 5. The production line is operating at full capacity. 6. The Board of Directors has fixed the annual general meeting for Tuesday the 2nd. 7. Can you email head office as soon as possible and find out about the designs for the new window displays? 8. I'm afraid all our engineers are out working on repairs at the moment. Unit 4. Organisation. Track 22. 1. Well, in some ways it's quite a conservative company, so some of the systems are a bit old-fashioned. There's still a lot of paperwork, so I suppose you could say it's very bureaucratic. I seem to spend a lot of time looking in files, both on the computer and in our paper archives. 2. Our department seems to be busy all the time. We're always getting inquiries from journalists and dealing with the broadcast media. I guess it's because we have such a high-profile boss. Although the company itself is quite hierarchical, our department is actually very democratic. Everyone is an equal member of the team. 3. It's a big department and we deal with a lot of employees. It's everything from recruitment and running training courses through to dealing with retirement. It's quite a progressive company, so everything is open plan, which is a bit difficult if I need to have a private meeting. There are meeting rooms, but they always seem to be busy. Unit 4. Organisation. Track 23. 1. Bureaucratic. 2. Decentralised. 3. Impersonal. 4. Caring. 5. Democratic. 6. Market driven. 7. Centralised. 8. Dynamic. 9. Professional. 10. Conservative. 11. Hierarchical. 12. Progressive. Unit 4. Organisation. Track 24. How do you analyse a company's organisation? Well, we take a fairly broad view of organisation. We start with the formal structure of lines and boxes, who reports to who, uh, what their official responsibilities are. But it's very important to go beyond that and think first about their decision rights. What does a position actually have the authority to decide? Who do they need to consult? Who do they need to keep informed? Who do they need to have approvals? Third area is information flows. If you want to understand how a company works, you need to know who knows what. So we look at communications, information, the sort of data that is provided to, and who gets it. And then the final area is the rewards, the performance management. Not just who gets bonuses and what they're based on, but how do you get promoted and how do people get rewarded in all the other ways that provide incentives in an organisation. We put all those four things together, the formal organisation, the decision rights, the information flows, and the incentives, and we call that the organisational DNA. So we put a lot of emphasis on understanding that. Unit 4. Organisation. Track 25. If you want to start an analysis, we have a survey tool 
It's on a website, orgdna.com, where you can answer just a small number of questions about your organization. And then we compare that to answers from about 40,000 other executives. And we can recognize patterns. And that helps us to say that your organization is like these other organizations. And so we can get some learning from comparable organization. And we call that the org DNA profiler. It gives you a superficial view, and it's a good place to start the conversation. But then we have to go much deeper. And we usually organize both workshops with the executives and probes into particular aspects that seem to be particularly interesting. So, for example, we might take a single major controversial decision and look at how that was actually made. And really, you often find that the reality is quite different from the theory. Unit 4. Organization. Track 26. Can you give us an example of how you've helped a company with its organization? I recently did a major piece of work for a very large global American company that was organized by function. So manufacturing had responsibility for all the plants around the world. Marketing ran all the brands in every country. That was a very efficient organization, but it wasn't very good at responding to the local markets. And so they decided that they wanted to move to a geographically based organization. So we had to figure out, first of all, what were the right geographies? Was every country a separate geography or are we going to put some together? What are you going to do for Europe as a whole as well as what are you going to do for Germany and for Spain? Um, so the, we, we did a lot of look at how the business operated, where pl products were made, where they were shipped to, how competitors were organized. And we also had to spend a lot of time thinking about whether we needed regional organizations or whether every single business unit would report back to the headquarters uh, in the US. Unit 4. Organization. Track 27. Hello, Alex. Great to see you again. Hi, Maria. How are you? Fine, thanks. I haven't seen you for ages. We last met at that trade show in Geneva, didn't we? How is everything going with you? Yes, we did. Uh, great. Pretty well at the moment, thanks. I'm still in the same department, but I got promoted last year, so I'm now head of marketing. I'm in charge of 50 people. Oh, fantastic. How about you? Are you still in sales? Actually, no. I changed my job last year. I'm in finance now. I'm really enjoying it. That's good. Yes, but the big news is, Alex, I finally passed my driving test. Hey! <laughs> it took me three attempts, but I finally did it, and now I am going to get a sports car. Really? That's great. Well, congratulations. Unit 4. Organization. Track 28. Hi, my name's Bob Danvers. Hi, good to meet you. I'm Karin Schmidt. Which part of the group are you working for? I've just joined MCB. Uh, we provide all the market research. What about you? I'm with Clearview. I don't know much about Clearview. What sort of projects do you work on? Well, we're basically an outsourcing business. We supply companies and organizations with various services, including IT, office equipment, travel, and even cleaning services. I see. And is it a new company? No, we're well established. The company was founded in the mid-1980s, and we've been growing rapidly ever since. It's organized into four divisions. We have over 7,000 employees. We've got our headquarters in London and offices in New York, Cape Town, and Sydney. So we're pretty big. Unit 4. Organization. Track 29. Christoph, I'd like you to meet Natalie. She's joining us from the Italian subsidiary. She'll be with us for the next 12 months. Nice to meet you, Christoph. It's a pleasure. Natalie speaks fluent Spanish, so she could be very useful when you're dealing with our South American customers. 
she's also very keen on sailing, so you two should have plenty to talk about. Oh, that's interesting. I'm sure you're much better than me. I'm a beginner, really. But I do love it. Let me show you where you'll be working. It's over here. By the way, would you like a coffee? Unit 4. Organization. Track 30. I suppose you've all seen the Vice President's message on the notice boards. What do you think, Francoise? Huh. It's pretty typical, isn't it? It's all about how the company will benefit. What about us? Don't we count? Yeah, yeah exactly. Is what exactly. I'm I mean, why should we leave this beautiful building on one of the most famous avenues in the world? We love it here. The move's not convenient for me at all. If we go to Beauchamp, my husband will have to drive 120 kilometers every day to get to work. He'll soon get tired of doing that. And what about my children's education? Will the schools be any good in Beauchamp? I have no idea. How about you, Jean-Pierre? Well, to be honest, it doesn't bother me. I'm really tired of living in Paris. It's so stressful here. Everyone rushing around, trying to make money. I wouldn't mind moving to a quieter area. <laughs> Beauchamp sounds quite nice, and the countryside outside the town is pleasant, I believe. Uh, what about you, Paolo? Do you think the move will be good for us? I am... Um absolutely against it. It will upset families and they cause a lot of problems for some stuff. I will have to sell my apartment if we move. I only bought it last year, so I will probably lose a lot of money. I don't think I will get any compensation for that, do you? You don't agree, Jean-Pierre? I can see that. Well, you're right, Paolo. It uh, causes a lot of problems. There is no doubt about that. But the company will benefit a lot. And that's important too. Mm. In the long run, the move will increase our revenue, make us more competitive, and keep us in jobs. That's a good reason for moving, isn't it, Carl? Uh, what do you think? Maybe. But I feel pretty depressed at the moment. I hope they'll postpone the proposal. There's a lot of bad feeling about it. I tell you one thing. A lot of our best staff will refuse to relocate. They can easily get another job here in Paris. They won't want to move. They've got a really good lifestyle, and they won't want to give it up. The management will get a big shock if the relocation goes ahead. Unit 5. Advertising. Track 31. What are the key elements of a really good advertising campaign? When I answer the question of what really makes a good advertising campaign, I always go back to the beginning and ask the question, what is the person who's paying for the campaign trying to achieve? What is that person's objectives? What is it that that person wants to happen as a result of spending money on this advertising campaign? So in order to decide whether it is good or bad, it is first of all most important to understand what it is that the campaign must try and achieve. Some people might say, well that's obvious, to sell more goods, to sell more services, to sell more bottles of Coca-Cola or jeans, and often of course it is simply to sell more of a product, but not always. Sometimes it is to change the image of a company. Sometimes it is to change people's views of an issue. Sometimes it is to get people to drink less alcohol, to do up their seat belts, to change the way in which they use energy. So a good or bad advertising campaign depends on what it is there to achieve. Unit 5. Advertising. Track 32. Can you take us through the typical planning and launch stages of a campaign? So when we look at the different stages of a campaign, we tend to start always with the briefing. 
The first stage is to identify the brief from the client and to agree the brief with the client. It is at this stage that we tend to agree the objectives are referred to earlier. What will make the client happy after this campaign has been aired. The second stage is then to take that brief and articulate it for the people in our organisations who have to make recommendations and have ideas about the campaign itself. At this stage we brief creative people to come up with ideas and media people to, ask, to have ideas about which channels those ideas will be seen in. The third stage will be the presentation of those ideas to the client. There is then some debate. That debate process can go on for quite a long time until there's agreement. At that point of agreement, we get into the execution phase. The execution phase is where we then produce the creative material and buy the space and places in the channels of distribution for that material. Unit 5. Advertising. Track 33. Can you give us an example of a successful new media campaign? One of the most successful new media campaigns, and from one of the clients that uses new media best, is Nike. Uh, Nike, of course, have a young audience who are very literate about the new media and therefore live their lives in that medium. And so rather than simply use advertising on television to talk to this a youthful audience, what Nike does is they start seeding viral campaigns. And viral campaigns are pieces of film, pieces of content, which they hope will be picked up by individuals who see it, perhaps on YouTube, and passed on to their friends with comments to say, look at this piece of film, isn't it fantastic? Perhaps the most famous piece of uh, Nike viral was Ronaldinho, the footballer, preparing to be able to uh, lob the ball directly onto the goal, post, uh, goal bar and it bouncing back to him ten times. It, a piece of outrageous skill which was just about believable and then the viral campaign actually became about was it real or was it faked. So what it is not only an entertaining piece of film but it generated its own PR, public relations exercise, it generated its own gossip on the web? The answer was it was fake. Unit 5 Advertising Track 34 1 Could I have your attention please? Right, good morning everyone. On behalf of Alpha Advertising I'd like to welcome you. My name's Mark Hayward, I'm Creative Director. This morning I'd like to outline the campaign concept we've developed for you. I've divided my presentation into three parts. Firstly, I'll give you the background to the campaign. Secondly, I'll discuss the target markets. Finally, I'll talk you through the media we plan to use. I'd be grateful if you could leave any questions to the end. So, first of all, let me give you some of the background to the campaign that we've developed for you. Two. Right. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Hayward. As you may know, I'm Creative Director of Alpha Advertising. Great to see you all. Anyway, I'm here to tell you about the ideas we've come up with for the ad campaign. My talk is in three parts. I'll start with the background to the campaign, move on to the target markets, and finish with the media we plan to use. If there's anything you're not clear about, feel free to stop me and ask any questions. Right. So, the background to the campaign is that we were given the brief... Unit 5. Advertising. Track 35. And particularly in Germany, where this is very important. Just to give you a specific example, if you look at the next slide, we can see from the chart that the key age group is 18 to 25 but that this will become less, not more, important as the product matures in the market. As I say, this is reflected across all the markets. Right, that's all I have to say about the target markets. 
Let's now move on to the final part and the media we plan to use. We'll start in a month's time with a viral campaign on the internet to generate interest, of which more later. Then there is the new TV commercial, which I'll be showing you in the form of a storyboard at the end of the presentation. Finally, we intend to use images from the commercial for outdoor advertising on hoardings and public transport. This will be linked to a coordinated press campaign starting in June. So, to sum up then, before we go to the storyboard, the key points again are that firstly, the product already has wide appeal, so we're really just developing the brand and trying to keep it fresh. Secondly, that we will need to bear in mind the younger sections of the market for the future. And finally, the key to getting the campaign started is the viral advertising campaign. Thank you very much. Now, are there any questions? Unit 6. Money. Track 36. And now, the business news. There was a further downturn in the economy this month as the recession in the United States and Asia-Pacific region continues. Yesterday was another day of heavy trading on the stock market, with big losses in share values. The forecast for the near future is not good, as market confidence remains low. Paradise Lane, the struggling luxury hotel group, is seeking new investment to try and avoid bankruptcy, following the announcement of disastrous interim results. It currently has a debt of nearly $5 billion. There were rumours of rivals GHN taking a large equity stake in the troubled hotel group. Phoenix Media announced a 15% increase in pre-tax profits on an annual turnover of $4.5 million. Added to the strong performance in the last quarter, this is likely to result in an increased dividend of over 14 cents per share, well up on last year, which will certainly please shareholders. Following a rise in sales in the emerging markets of... The Unit 6. Money. Track 37. Could you tell me what your role is as an investment director? The aim of the business is to provide investment solutions for private individuals who have uh, capital that they wish to employ to achieve a certain level of return. Um, my role as the investment director is to both design the strategy for the client with an intention of meeting that aim, that return, and also then manage that strategy on an ongoing basis. Unit 6. Money. Track 38. What are the main areas that you invest in? We invest in a number of different areas to try and, as I said earlier, to keep the overall spread of investment right. And they really start from the lowest risk asset, which is cash. And then we introduce other asset classes that have different risk and return profiles. So as one is prepared to take on a bit more risk, then obviously one's going to potentially get some more return. So moving up the scale of risk, we go from cash to fixed interest securities, where in effect the client will be lending their money to either a government or a company in return for a fixed rate of return with a view that capital will increase over a period of time. We then look at um, index linked, i.e. linked to the rate of inflation securities. Uh, equities will be the next level of risk, an equity being a stock or a share where you're buying a part of a company and obviously as the companies perform better so the price of that share should, in should increase. We then look at slightly more esoteric or different areas of investment to give some return that's not linked to equity returns, to share returns. For instance, commercial property is an area where one can achieve fairly good income return, but you're investing long term into bricks and mortar, something that you can see, something that's slightly more safe. We also look at uh, commodities, so looking at precious metals, either gold or platinum. We look at agriculture, which has become an interesting area of development over the last 20 years. And then we have the final asset class we call our alternative investments. And they can be either hedge funds, which invest in lots of different areas, 
or something that's called absolute return funds where the manager will invest money across a whole wide range of areas with a view to giving small incremental elements of return over a reasonable period. And as I said earlier, we try and combine those asset classes to get the best level of risk and return. Unit 6. Money. Track 39. In difficult economic times, what would you suggest are attractive areas for investment? There are a number of uh, attractive areas, uh, and I think I've touched on one earlier with the bond investments, but perhaps I'll develop that a little bit further. A lot depends really on where we are within that economic cycle. If we are at the very bottom of an economic cycle, then the best form of, of recovery is probably going to be in companies who are going to recover as the economy recovers. So when prices are very low, you could invest in, in a, an equity of a company where you saw they would, they would benefit from that reduction in interest rates that you've seen. If it's in the early stages of an economic depression or recession, shall we call it, then with interest rates likely to be cut aggressively, then obviously the fixed income area of, of the market is, is perhaps the most appropriate place to be. Another area which I think has traditionally been a, a very safe haven has been gold. And I think over the, the last 15 years or so, gold has been through a number of different cycles. And in particular, I think as a recovery play, it will always be perceived as a store of value. At the same time, as the emerging markets keep continuing to grow, there's a, no, there's a lot of interest and appetite for people to invest in gold in terms of their jewellery, as well as wishing to own, to own that asset. So I think gold, fixed income securities and early cycle equities would be my answer. Unit 6. Money. Track 40. Business in brief. It was a bad day for the London market. Following disappointing results from FedEx in the US and fears of a credit crunch, the FTSE 100 fell 105 points, or 1.8%, to 5,756.9, while the FTSE 250 fell 189.1 points, or 1.9%, to 9,534.8. Only eight blue-chip stocks managed to make gains. The best was Smith & Nephew. Shares in the medical devices group rose 2.9% to 595.5 pence after UBS upgraded the stock to a buy recommendation. SNN was also supported by rumours of a bid approach from a Japanese company. On the other hand, British Airways, down 5.2% to 225 and three quarter pence, fell even further after Morgan Stanley cut its target to 149 pence. This was because of worries about increasing fuel prices. Tate and Lyle, the sugar and sweeteners group, lost 5.2% to 402 and a quarter pence after Citigroup lowered its forecasts because of rising corn prices. Following recent floods in the US, the cost of corn has risen 25%. Unit 6. Money. Track 41. So, to summarize, our product is a storage device with a modular design. It's very flexible, very versatile. It can be divided up, added to, and shaped to fit any space in a house or apartment. You can put bottles, flowers, magazines, fruit, nuts, lots of other things in it. It's lightweight, durable, and very stylish, and made out of a special recyclable material. We're looking for an investment of $200,000 from you in return for a stake of 25% in our business. The name of our product is Multistore. Unit 6. Money. Track 42. Okay. Another question I'd like to ask you. Have you taken out a patent for the device? Uh, yes, we have. The product is fully protected against copying. Excellent. And what's your profit margin on each 10-module unit? It's approximately 80%. Hmm, quite good. 
And how about your forecasts for the next three years, turnover and profit? In year one, we forecast a turnover of $150,000 and a profit of approximately $120,000. Year two, turnover of $600,000 and a profit of $480,000. And in year three, a turnover of $3 million and a profit of $2.4 million. Now, I'd like to ask a question. How many of the 10 module units have you sold and who have you sold them to? I can answer that question as I'm the salesperson in our team. We've sold about 2,000 units, mainly to major department stores and specialist shops for household goods in New York and Chicago. Okay, thanks for all the information. Now, I'll tell you what I think. I like your product. It's definitely got sales potential, and I'd like to make you an offer. I'll give you the full amount, $200,000. But I'd want a stake of 50% in your business. The market for this sort of product is very competitive. There's a lot of risk involved, and marketing and promoting it could be very expensive. So that's the deal I'm offering you. Hmm. We'll have to think about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about you? Are you interested as well? Yes, I like the product as well. But I also think it'll need a lot of marketing to get established. And you may have to change the packaging. So, I'll offer you the full amount, $200,000, for a stake of 45%. Okay, so we seem to have two offers on the table. Could I ask each of you what business expertise you could bring to our business? How much help could you give us apart from money? Well, I have a company which sells household products to the retail trade, and it's very successful. You would be able to use our sales force to build up sales and develop the brand, and I would be very hands-on in developing your product. In my case, I have a very good track record investing in startup businesses like yours. Basically, I invest in people, and I've been impressed with your presentation. I think we could work well together. Thanks to both of you. Could we have a break and consider your offer? By all means. Certainly. But take your time. Working across cultures. 2. International meetings. Track 43. The culture we come from or live in influences what we see, do, believe and say. It affects our expectations and behaviour, and we need to be very aware of it. The simple fact is that what's normal or appropriate for us may seem very strange or even rude to someone from a different culture. I'll look at three of the key areas of culture which may affect communication in international meetings, causing confusion and frustration. Firstly, time. Not all cultures or people are ruled by the clock. There are some cultures, it's true, where the feeling is indeed that time is money. They will often have strict approaches to this aspect of meetings, such as starting and finishing times and the duration of discussion. Other cultures, however, have a completely different approach and see the starting time as a guide only, and the finishing time as not fixed. Other stages may be surprisingly flexible, and you may find that there is little attempt to stick to the agenda. Secondly, the idea of hierarchy in a culture, and therefore in meetings, can be very significant. By this, we mean the relative levels of importance and seniority which people have in a company. Someone from a very hierarchical culture is likely to feel very uncomfortable saying what they think or criticising the ideas of others, especially if the person being criticised holds a higher position. They are also unlikely to openly disagree or report a problem in front of a boss or manager. Criticising the ideas of a superior could be seen as a loss of face for both people involved. 
Another key area to think about is the objective of the meeting. In many cultures, there's an attitude that meetings should have very clear purposes and get down to business pretty quickly. Using a structured, pre-planned agenda is important. In such cases, there's very little in the way of small talk, maybe just a couple of comments about the weather, football, etc. However, other cultures see meetings as the place for relationship building and developing trust. So the meeting may be a lengthy discussion, and actual decisions may often be made outside the meeting. Again, the idea that the purpose of a meeting is to make a decision may be alien to some cultures. It's important to bear this in mind, as it can be quite a surprise if you're not used to it. Finally, some advice on successful international meetings. Clarifying is key in any international meeting. Different cultural assumptions mean that sometimes spoken language, body language, including gestures and written symbols, can be misunderstood. Constant checking and feedback is crucial. At the end of a meeting. It's vital to summarize the main areas of agreement and disagreement, and ensure that everyone's happy with them, to avoid confusion and frustration later. Overall, any international meeting requires planning, organization, and thinking about if it's to succeed. We must consider how cultural differences may affect mutual understanding. And we should try to predict any areas open to misunderstanding before they happen. Unit Seven, Cultures, Track Forty Four. Can you give us some examples of culture shock that people have experienced? There are many, many examples of, of culture shock, and、uh, many of those really come about because people haven't prepared themselves、uh, well enough. Some examples of that might be、uh, timing, where in some cultures the concept、uh, and perception of timekeeping is very different.、Uh, and I guess the obvious one that people always use is is the example of the Middle East. The Middle Eastern clock、uh, really revolves around two things: really the prayer times, and of course,、um, because they were desert travellers,、uh, about the movements of the sun and the moon、uh, during periods of the day.、Um, other examples is where, again, around time, where Perhaps from a, a Latin culture's perspective,、um, it's about building relationships before you actually get down to to business. Now, very often Western and particularly American business people find that very frustrating. For Americans, time is money, and so they'll be very keen to actually.、Uh, the salesman will be very keen to get out his sales literature and start exalting the, the virtues of the product he's trying to sell you.、Uh, they'll try to get on with the agenda as quickly as as possible. Whereas, particularly in Latin cultures and also in people like Chinese cultures,、uh, relationship building is very important. They'll want to entertain you for sure, and very often invite you back to their home. And all this before they actually want to sit down and, and do business with you, because in the Latin culture they are making judgments about you as an individual as, as to whether you're the kind of person that they want to do business with. Unit Seven, Cultures, Track Forty Five. Are some people better suited for international business than others? Absolutely.、Uh, what companies still tend to do is select people for international、uh, business and business assignments、uh, purely based on their skill set. So, if you're the the best civil engineer or you're the greatest IT consultant in the business, it is often thought that this fully equips you to be the best person to conduct that business internationally. Clearly, those skills are very important, but they have to be underpinned by, I think, a number of personal traits that make you a more effective international business person. Some of those traits:、um, adaptability. You have got to be prepared to adapt the way that you do business, or adapt your expectations or your needs to meet the needs of the of the culture of the people that you're doing business with. So, adaptability, flexibility. Is obviously very important.、Uh, you've got to be prepared to actually change the parameters with which you are intending to do business. 
Unit Seven, Cultures, Track Forty Six. Very important,、uh, and you'll know from this course in communication,、um, you've got to be a good listener.、Uh, you've got to pay more attention than you would when speaking to somebody in your own culture to make sure that you have understood quite clearly what is being said. And one of the things that we always say to people is that to be very sure that you've actually heard what you think you've heard. There are some steps you can take. It's always a very good idea to get the individual, if you're not clear, to repeat what they've said. It may seem tedious to you, but actually, it's very important to make sure that you haven't made mistakes. I think also one of the key features、uh, of the successful international business person is to be non-judgmental. For instance, if you're coming from、uh, an Asian culture、uh, to try and do business with a, a Western culture. Uh, for certain, the way that the people do things will be fundamentally different.、Uh, the hierarchy, the structure, the decision-making process, the seniority, and the influence of the people you're doing business with will be fundamentally different.、Uh, you may not agree, you may not approve of the way that business is done in another culture,、uh, but the way that people do business in that culture is as a result of many, many years of of development. And so you have to be accepting、uh, that it's it may be not to your liking, and it may be different, but it is not wrong. Unit Seven, Cultures, Track Forty Seven, One. Small talk is one way to break the ice when meeting someone for the first time. Two. I was thrown in at the deep end when my company sent me to run the German office. I was only given two days' notice to get everything ready. Three. We don't see eye to eye with our U.S. parent company about punctuality. We have very different ideas about what being on time means. It's a question of culture. Four. I got into hot water with my boss for wearing casual clothes to the meeting with the potential Japanese customers. Five. I really put my foot in it when I met our Spanish partner, because I was nervous. I said, "Who are you?" rather than "How are you?" Six. I get on like a house on fire with our Polish agent. We like the same things and have the same sense of humour. Seven. When I visited China for the first time, I was like a fish out of water. Everything was so different, and I couldn't read any of the signs. Eight. My first meeting with our overseas clients was a real eye opener. I hadn't seen that style of negotiation before. Unit Seven, Cultures, Track Forty Eight. So, where did you go on holiday then? Italy. Did you have a good time? Yes, it was okay. And which part of Italy did you go to? Sicily. I've been to Sicily, Taormina. I really enjoyed it. What did you think of it? Nothing special. Oh, right. So, how is it going at work? We're busy. That's really good, isn't it? <laughs> Don't know about that. Unit Seven, Cultures, Track One, One. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your name. Two. I'm really sorry. I'd love to, but I'm afraid I'm going to the theatre on Wednesday night. Three. Not for me, thanks. I'm not keen on seafood. Four. I'm sorry, but I really do have to be going. It was really nice talking to you. Five. Welcome to our headquarters. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm James Clayton. Six. Katrina, can I introduce you to Greg? Greg's over from the States. Greg, this is Katrina Seidler, my boss. 
Seven. Please let me get this. Eight. Here's to our future success. Nine. I'm very sorry to hear about what happened. Ten. I'm sorry I'm late. The traffic from the airport was terrible. Unit seven, cultures, track two. Is this your first visit to the region? No, I come here quite a lot, but usually to Hong Kong. Oh, really? What do you do? I'm an account director for a marketing company. <laughs> How long have you been there? Nearly five years now. Have you been to Tokyo before? No, this is my first trip.、Uh, business or pleasure? Business, I'm afraid. How long have you been here? Six days. And how long are you staying? Until tomorrow evening. Where are you staying? At the Metropolitan Hotel. What's the food like? It's very good, but eating at the Metropolitan can be quite expensive. So, what do you think of Tokyo? I really like it. There's so much to see and do. Unit seven, cultures, track three. So, Enrique, what can you tell me about Germany? Well, I don't think there'll be any language problem for you. Most German business people are pretty fluent in English, and they'll use English with you, as you don't know any German. They're pretty formal in business. So don't be surprised at how they address each other. They tend to use family names, not first names, when they talk to each other. I see. What about when you first meet German managers? How do you greet them? Well, generally they shake hands. Okay. Ah,、uh, how about topics of conversation? Say, if I ask it out for dinner or whatever. What are good topics of conversation in France? Oh, that's easy. French people love talking about food. They're very proud of their cuisine, so you can't go wrong if you introduce that topic into the conversation. The French are like the Spanish and Portuguese; they'll go on for hours talking about local dishes.、Mm, that's good to hear. I love talking about food too, but. I like food a bit too much, so I'm always worrying about my weight. What about safe topics of conversation in Russia? You've spent quite a lot of time there, haven't you? Yeah,、uh, Russians like food too, so it's a good topic. But you could try asking Russians you meet about the state of the economy. That'll get them going. Most Russians love talking about the economy and the problems they're having. It's a really good subject, and Russian men like to talk about ice hockey. It's a very popular sport there. By the way, plenty of Russians speak English well, so you won't have any problems understanding them. But you may have difficulty reading the name of streets, because they're all in Cyrillic script. It can be very confusing for visitors. Oh, thanks. What about Germany? What do Germans like talking about? If you're with men, just bring up the subject of football. They're as keen on football as we are in Portugal. Germans expect to win any match they play, and they often do, except when they play the Brazilians or the Italians. Yeah, football's a great topic of conversation with men. I'm not sure what subjects German women like talking about. Okay, thanks very much. What about gifts? Supposing I'm invited out to dinner, what do I bring with me to give my host? Well, in France,、uh, most visitors bring flowers for their hostess. Everyone loves to receive them, and in Russia too, flowers are very acceptable. They'd also be a great gift in Germany. Yeah. Flowers are the answer in most countries, I'd say. But what else would be a good gift? Chocolate, something typical from my country. Would they like that? Do you think?
Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 4. Well, what usually happens is that an employer will advertise a vacancy or new post, sometimes both inside and outside the company. Then, after they have received all the applications, they will screen them, go through and shortlist the candidates for interview, choosing those who appear to meet the criteria for the job. Next, they will assemble an interview panel, which is perhaps as many as four or five people in some cases and then call the candidates to interview. Some employers choose to check references at this stage to avoid delays later, while others wait until after the interview when they have chosen one of the candidates. Provided the panel is happy, the employer will make a job offer, and the successful candidate starts work. Often he or she will attend induction sessions, or be given a mentor who helps to train new staff. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 5. A. Enthusiastic. B. Adaptable. C. Methodical. D. Reliable. E. Ambitious. F. Objective. G. Creative. H. Analytical. I. Authoritative. J. Practical. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 6. How do you help people to find the right job? As a specialist recruiter, our role is to assist job seekers in finding the perfect role for them. Uh, we do that predominantly via our network of offices globally. Uh, candidates will have the opportunity to come in, meet with a Hayes consultant, and the Hayes consultant will work with them to gain an understanding of what type of role they're looking for, what type of organisation they would like to work for, and really anything else that they feel is appropriate for them finding the right role for them. In addition, we'll also work with them on how they present themselves. Your CV, for example. We will work through a CV, perhaps give tips and hints as to how best to present that so that the candidate has the best possible opportunity of being represented in the right way to the client. We also use our Hayes.com website, which is a job seekers website. Candidates can apply online for roles that we advertise um, and they will also have the opportunity to get advice from that website as well as to how they should structure their application. There's quite often more information about a prospective employer on there so that you can really see straight from the website what type of role is best for you. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 7. Is there any particular preparation you recommend before a job interview? Preparation is absolutely key for any job interview. Your Hayes consultant can assist you prior to that in getting that interview and presenting your CV, but ultimately, at the end of the day, during that meeting with an employer, it's really down to you. We advise all of our prospective job seekers to certainly look at their appearance. You need to look your best for an interview. The other aspect of preparation which is absolutely key is to research your employer. Most organisations have websites so we always recommend that people conduct a lot of research into that company's website, anything that's going on, any press clippings, any information that you can use to prove to the employer that you have actually made an effort to research them before attending the interview. From the point of view of the actual vacancy, we would always recommend that you look at the duties within that, that vacancy and have a think about where in your previous experience you might be able to demonstrate your ability to do that job. Unit 8. 
Human Resources, Track 8. What recent changes have you noticed in the job market? I think probably the most unique change in the job market in the most recently is the intervention of online recruitment and web-based recruitment and websites. For us as a global business, it means that we can truly act in that way. We can recruit roles in the UK that are based wherever. Equally, we can recruit, recruit roles from India that are based wherever. It also means that the candidate or job seekers do have um, a huge amount of choice. You can go onto your website at home, sitting at home, and look at roles and jobs that are advertised globally, worldwide. So it's an absolutely unique opportunity for both candidates and employers. Equally, um, in terms of the recruitment market, we have seen in the last years, few years a development in the need for interim employees and temporary employees. Lots of organisations now are going through periods of change and I think and it's an accepted fact that organisations will continue to go through change and quite often specialist people will need to be brought in on project basis to undertake specific projects in areas such as IT, human resources, project management generally will be very sought after. Unit 8, Human Resources, Track 9 Good morning. My name is Cindy Tan. I'm calling about your advertisement in the China Post for Marketing Assistant. I was wondering if you could give me a little more information. Uh, certainly. What do you need to know? Well, first of all, am I still in time to apply? I only saw the advert today. A newspaper was two weeks old, so I was thinking maybe it's too late? No, don't worry. You're not too late. But you must hurry because uh, the closing date for application is this Friday, so you haven't got a lot of time. I see. That gives me just a couple of days. Well, I see there's an application form on your website, so I'll complete it right away and email it to you. Uh, good. I look forward to getting it. Just one or two more questions. I'd also like to know when the successful candidate has to start work with you I mean, if I get the job, will I be able to give my present employer sufficient notice? Okay, that's a good question. How much notice would you need to give? Well, I think my contract states that I have to give a month's notice. Oh, that's no problem at all. We uh, wouldn't expect anyone to join us immediately. In fact, if you were offered the job, I believe you'd start after the new year. That would give you plenty of time. OK, so just to get this clear, I probably wouldn't have to start working until February, and maybe even later? Exactly. One last question. Can I ask you what the salary is? It wasn't given in the effort. You're right. It would depend on a lot of things. Qualifications, experience, personal qualities, that sort of thing. Are you saying you can't give me a figure? That's right. The salary is negotiable. But I can tell you, we pay very competitive salaries. I don't think you'll be disappointed by the starting salary we offer. OK. I think that's everything. Thanks very much for your help. Not at all. And good luck if you get an interview. Thanks very much. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 10. Could I ask you, Mr. Wilder, why you want to leave your present job? Okay, well, uh, I really enjoy teaching languages, but uh, I'm 52 now, and I feel I need a new challenge. Hmm. Something to really motivate me. Mm -hmm. It's not about money. We're very well off as a family. But recently, I felt teaching really wasn't enough, wasn't stretching me. I wasn't going to work with a good feeling inside me. Let me put it that way. So basically you were bored? Exactly. Okay. Now, what would you say is your main weakness in terms of this job? Hmm. That's a tricky question. Let me think. Hmm. Well, I seem to get on well with most people. 
you know, I'm very easygoing. Everyone says so. Mm -hmm. And someone has to do something really bad to me before I get angry. In fact, I can't remember the last time I got angry. I try to avoid confrontation with people. What's the point? I mean, for example, a lot of people say to me, you seem to have such a happy marriage, you two. You never seem to argue, and I say, <laughs> well, actually, we never do. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Well, uh, perhaps. A final question. Why should we offer you the job? Well, I've got a background organizing sports. I'm very fit, as you can see, and I think teaching's just like running a health and leisure center. Mm -hmm. You need the same skills to get on well with people, have good communication skills, and plenty of common sense. I'll find lots of ways to make money for you and increase the profits of the business. Mm. Also, don't forget, I have a very good academic background. <laughs> Yale is one of the best universities in the world, and my master's in sports management is ideal for the job, even if I did get it years ago. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 11. My first question, Mr. Consalves, is why do you want to leave your present job? Well, my present job is okay, I suppose. But I think I can do better. Who doesn't? Hmm. I'm well known in Sao Paulo because of my movie career. And I think it's time for me to use my image to make more money. Mm -hmm. Actually, my agent suggested I apply for this job. He thought my background in martial arts would appeal to your organization. Okay, thanks. Now, what about your weaknesses? What would you say is a weakness in terms of the job we're offering? Well, I suppose I don't have a lot of educational qualifications. Mm -hmm. Probably the other candidates have more to offer in that area. But the teachers did try to widen my horizons when I was training to be an actor at RADA in London. Mm. I don't have qualifications in business, but it seems to me you need other qualities for the job you are offering, like a strong personality, a charismatic person with good people skills, and I've certainly got all that. Uh huh. Finally, why should we offer you the job? Offer me the job because I'm famous in Brazil, and that will attract lots of customers for you. Uh huh. And I've got a load of ideas for improving your clubs. I could send you a report, if you like, by the end of the week, showing what I would like to do to raise Fast Fitness's profile in Sao Paulo. I'm a very enterprising man, a risk taker, and that's what you want at the moment. Unit 8. Human Resources. Track 12. Could I ask you, Miss Gomez, why do you want to leave your present job? Okay, it's a good question. I really enjoy working for Superfit, mm -hmm. but it's rather a small center, and the equipment is mostly out of date. I don't think I'm using all my skills at the moment, and to be honest, I don't get on at all with my boss. Oh, What's the problem? Well, for one thing, I don't think he really values the work I do with people suffering from disease. I think he's a bit jealous of me, especially when I won that award. Hmm. But what really bugs me is that he doesn't appreciate the fact that I manage superfit most of the time. Mm -hmm. He's always away visiting the other centers, and then I'm in charge. It's a lot of responsibility, but he never gives me a word of thanks. What would you say is your main weakness in terms of this job? Well, my friends say um, I need to be more assertive. I just don't like upsetting people, so... I often do what they want instead of saying no. I suppose I'm a little shy, but I'm becoming more self-confident as I get older. 
Actually, I went on an assertiveness course a few weeks ago, and it really helped me a lot. A final question: Why should we offer you the job? Well, I've got lots of energy, and I really believe I can persuade people to have a healthier lifestyle. That's the key, I think, to building up a good fitness center. Also, I'm a creative person, and I will come up with other ideas for serving our local community and bringing more customers into fast fitness clubs. Unit Eight, Human Resources, Track Thirteen. First, Miss Cominelli, why do you want to leave your present job? That's easy to answer.、Uh... To be honest, I'm not being paid enough for my qualifications and experience.、Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a really big job that is well paid and will enable me to meet a lot of people and challenge me in the years to come. Okay. Now, what would you say is your main weakness in terms of this job?、Mm -hmm. uh, main weakness.、Mm -hmm. uh, I speak my mind, and that can sometimes upset people. <laughs> I'm not a diplomatic person, but staff and students know where they are with me, and they like that. I don't talk about people behind their back. I say it to their face, or not at all. A final question: Why should we offer you the job? Look,、uh, let me put my cards on the table. You're looking for someone who'll boost your profits and meet some very tough targets.、Mm -hmm. I can do that for you. I expect a lot from people working with me. I set high standards, and staff have to achieve those standards. That's the bottom line. I believe in rewarding people who do well and getting rid of those who don't, and that's the kind of general manager you need at the moment. So that's why you should offer me the job. Unit Nine, International Markets, Track Fourteen. Perhaps you could summarize for our listeners the points you've made so far, Ian. You started by telling us what free trade is. Right, I defined it as a situation in which goods come into and out of a country without any controls or taxes. Countries which truly believe in free trade try to liberalize their trade. That's to say, they take away barriers to trade. They remove things which stop people trading freely. They have open borders and few controls of goods at customs. Unit Nine, International Markets, Track Fifteen. Okay. Then you gave us several examples of barriers to trade. Yes. I said that there are two main barriers: tariffs and subsidies. Tariffs are taxes on imported goods, so that the imports cannot compete so well against domestic products. Subsidies are money paid to domestic producers, so that they can sell their goods more cheaply than foreign competitors. Tariffs and subsidies are barriers to trade because when people are given a choice. Generally, they will buy the cheapest product. You mentioned other barriers, less important ones, perhaps. Uh huh. I talked about quotas, which limit the quantity of a product which can be imported, and I discussed other restrictions on trade, such as expensive licenses for importers, which add greatly to costs, and regulations relating to documents which a company must have to export its goods to certain countries. The documents can be very complicated and difficult to complete, so they slow down trading. Unit Nine, International Markets, Track Sixteen. I asked you if free trade was always a good thing, and I answered in principle, yes, it is a good thing. It's beneficial to countries. Why? Countries which open their markets usually have a policy of deregulation. That's to say, they free their companies to compete in markets without government control or subsidies. 
Because of this, consumers in free trade areas are offered a wider range of high quality products at lower prices. People in those areas can move to the most productive parts of the economy and get better jobs with higher wages or salaries, okay? So, why do so many countries protect their industries and not allow free markets? <laughs> I gave three reasons, if you remember. Firstly, some people say, why should we practice free trade if other nations compete unfairly? For example, dumping is fairly common in international trade. When companies dump goods in overseas markets, they sell goods at very low prices, usually for less than it costs the company to produce the goods. Companies can usually only do that when they are heavily subsidised by their governments. And secondly, many people believe that strategic industries must be protected. These are industries that are very important to the economy – steel, power, communications and so on. In the United States, many Americans think that the steel industry should be protected against cheap imports from Brazil and other countries. If the US depends too much on foreign-made steel, they argue, this could be bad in a time of war. Finally, some say that in developing countries, industries need to be protected until they are strong enough to compete in world markets. This is the infant industry argument. Certain industries have to be protected until they can stand on their own feet, as it were. And my final point was that, throughout the world, there is a trend towards liberalising trade and removing trade barriers. The most successful economies tend to have open markets, and most of their industries have been deregulated. Unit 9. International Markets. Track 17. If I order 30,000 silk scarves, what discount will you offer us? On um, 30,000? Nothing. But if you buy 50,000 scarves, then we'll offer you 10%. OK, uh, I'll think about that. And tell me, if we placed a very large order, say uh, 80,000 units, would you be able to dispatch immediately? We can normally guarantee to dispatch a large order within three weeks. But if you order at a peak time, like just before the Chinese New Year, it would be impossible to deliver that quickly. I take it your price includes insurance? Actually, no. Usually, you'd be responsible for that. But if the order was really large, that would be negotiable, I'm sure. What about payment? To be honest, we'd prefer cash on delivery. As this is our first contract with you, if you were a regular customer, we would offer you 30 days credit, maybe even a little more. That's all right. I quite understand. Look, how about having some lunch now and continuing later this afternoon? Then we could meet for an evening meal. I know an excellent restaurant in Wan Chai. Yes. Let's continue after lunch. If I had more time, I would love to have dinner with you. But unfortunately, my flight for Tokyo leaves at 8 tonight. And I need to be at the airport by 6. Unit 9. International Markets. Track 18. How do you train people to be good negotiators? There are three things that are important in negotiation training. Number one is to create an environment where people can do. Using case studies and the use of video, people are able to see how they behave on video. They can look at what's appropriate and they can look at what is inappropriate. What I mean by that is where they're effective and where they are ineffective. Using feedback, people are then able to change their behaviour rather than just telling people about negotiation or reading a book. So the experience is vital. Number two, it's about keeping the learning fresh using different vehicles and different formats, whether that be uh, e-learning, watching videos online or recently podcasts, or whether it be through a series of uh, different activities following on the workshop to keep it live, keep it fresh, and to stop people falling into those old habits. 
The third thing that's very important indeed is to look at the feedback from the negotiations themselves. And at the GAP Partnership we use a ROI system, which means return on investment. We measure the effectiveness of those negotiations for many months after the training. And this enables us to tweak and change the training and make it more customised. But it also allows the client to see the effects of that training, to measure it, and that provides them with a degree of investment for the future. Unit 9. International Markets. Track 19. Do the same techniques work with every type of negotiation? Yes, this is a good point. Um, there is no one way to negotiate. There are many different ways to negotiate. The common misnomer is that people find one way of negotiating and they don't change. In fact, this concept of appropriateness, that's what we teach, says that there is no one way, there are many different ways, ranging from the very competitive, very high conflict negotiations that are generally win-lose, all the way through to the very, very cooperative negotiations which are deemed as win-win. And there's no right or wrong, or there's no good or bad, it's just what's appropriate to the circumstances that you either find yourself in as a negotiator, or better still, the circumstances that you put yourself in, if you're really in charge of that negotiation, and if you're really well prepared. Unit 9. International Markets. Track 20. What makes a really good negotiator? There are many behaviours that make a good negotiator. And uh, when I say good negotiator, it's the word appropriate. Appropriate in being able to change. And so the overriding thing is to be versatile, to be adaptable, to be able to change your behaviour according to those circumstances. And the behaviours that are appropriate are everything from being able to manage conflict, be able to uh, manage the pressure in a face-to-face -face negotiation, right the way through to being able to plan effectively, to be analytical, but at the other end of the spectrum to also be open-minded and creative, in other words to come up with ideas on how to repackage the negotiation and to have the self-discipline in being able to communicate that with the right use of language. And when I say the right use of language, uh, effective negotiators are able to watch for when there is more scope for negotiation. What I mean by that is the ability to be able to look out and listen for what we call soft exposing giveaways. These are the small bits of language around proposals that will tell you that your counterpart, the person on the other side of the table, has more negotiation room. And these are words like, I'm looking for, roughly, in the region of, around about, I'd like, I'm hoping for, currently, right now, uh, probably. Uh, these are words that negotiators spot to help them understand just how movable the other side is. And so language itself is very important and the control of that language, but also the ability to listen. Because the more information you have, the more powerful you become, because information is power. Unit 9. International Markets. Track 21. Extract 1. OK, let's go over our objectives again. What do we really want from this deal? Well, price is the main issue, I'd say. We want Pierlucci to supply us with some top-quality men's wallets, but we don't want to pay the prices listed in his catalogue. I agree. They are too high for our market. The wallets would never leave the shelves. So we need to get a substantial discount from him, at least 20%. Yeah, we should be able to do that. There's a recession in Italy at the moment. Money's tight. So he's not in a strong bargaining position. Exactly. But he won't admit that. Extract 2 I have never been to your store in Moscow. Can you tell me a bit about your customers? What sort of leather products do they buy? Are they very price conscious? 
Will they pay a higher price for really top quality products? How many men's wallets do you sell each week? Extract 3 If you can give us a discount of 25% for our first order, we can accept a later delivery date, say the end of June. But I do understand it won't be easy for you to get your new range of wallets to us by then. 25%? <laughs> I'm afraid that's far more than we usually offer new customers, even a store like yours, which I know is very prestigious. We could possibly send half your order by that date. Would that help? It certainly would, as the peak buying months are July and August. Let's come back to the discount later. Extract 4 How about if we send the first consignment by express delivery? We will probably use UPS or TNT as the carrier. They are very fast and reliable. And we'll send the remaining part of the order by regular air mail. That will take a little longer. Mm, that's OK. As long as you get the first part of the order to us by the end of June, that's vital. Trust me. I can guarantee delivery by that date. Extract 5 Normally, we only supply our top-of-the-range wallets in two colours, black and brown. Most customers ask for those colours. If you wanted other colors... Uh... What? You mean the wallets would be even more expensive? Well, we would have to charge a little more, because the quantities we produce in that color would be small. But we could do it. Extract 6 Great! We agree on prices, discounts, the items you want to buy, delivery and methods of payment. I will send you an email confirming what we have agreed and enclosing a draft invoice. Extract 7 OK. I think we have covered everything. If there are any points we have forgotten, just give me a call. Excellent. That was a very good meeting. I'm sure we'll do a lot of business in the future. I hope so. <laughs> now, about dinner tonight. What time would be convenient for you? Working across cultures. 3. Doing business internationally. Track 22. Martin did the right thing when he arrived for the meeting on time. The Japanese value punctuality greatly. He shouldn't have been upset by the number of Japanese staff at the meeting. The Japanese are used to working as a group. But he made a mistake with the business card. When you receive a business card from a Japanese person, you should examine it carefully and then put it on the table in front of you during the meeting. Martin asked a direct question about exclusivity. Matsumoto, like many Japanese, didn't want to say no, so he used an expression that Martin had to interpret. Martin may also have had to interpret Matsumoto's body language. Non-verbal communication is important in understanding Japanese business people. The Japanese believe in consensus and harmony. They want everyone to support an important decision, so many staff may be involved in decision-making, and the process may take longer than in the Western world. Martin made a mistake when he gave white water lilies as a gift for Matsumoto's wife. White flowers remind the Japanese of death. Working across cultures. 3. Doing business internationally. Track 23. So, Sven, how did it go, your trip to Sao Paulo? Mm, not too well. I felt a bit out of my depth while I was there. And I'm not sure I can work with Pedro Oliveira. We are very different. What happened? Well, I set up the appointment with Pedro two weeks before, and when I got to Sao Paulo, I confirmed by phone. Mm -hmm. There was a heavy thunderstorm that day. I arrived on time, but Pedro wasn't there. He turned up over an hour later, said something about 
traffic delays because of the storm, then shook my hand warmly, grabbed my arm and led me into his office. Uh-huh. Next thing, he offered me a cup of very strong coffee. I thanked him but said no. I'd already had two cups of coffee at my hotel. <laughs> then he said, we're very proud of our coffee here in Brazil. I wondered if I'd made a mistake to refuse his offer. Oh, maybe. Anyway, instead of getting down to business, he called three colleagues into the office. During the next hour, we talked about everything except business. <laughs> Football, the thunderstorm, and they asked me lots of questions about my family, life in Denmark and so on. I suppose you got a bit frustrated. Of course. I was impatient to start. Maybe I showed it a little. Anyway, it was lunchtime, so we went to a local restaurant. Great food, but no talk of business. So I asked them about the crime rate in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest, and what sort of government they had at the moment. But I'm afraid the topics didn't generate much discussion. They just didn't seem to want to talk about those things. But we did have a more lively discussion when we started comparing food in our two countries. Ah, interesting. Food is always a good topic of conversation when you're abroad. Yeah. We left the restaurant over two hours later, and then we all went to a business club. We played snooker until about six o'clock. It was very enjoyable, I must admit. As I was leaving to go back to my hotel, Petro put a hand on my shoulder and said he hoped I'd enjoyed the day. <laughs> so nothing happened on the first day? No. If we were talking about business, it was a wasted day. Working across cultures. 3. Doing business internationally. Track 24. Tell me about the second day. Things went better, I hope. Not really. I was meant to give my presentation at 10 in the morning. But his secretary phoned and told me the meeting was put off until 2 in the afternoon. Oh, that must have been annoying. It certainly was. Petra invited quite a few of his colleagues to attend the presentation. And that was okay, but they kept on interrupting me during my talk, asking lots of questions. <sighs> I became very impatient. I suggested they ask their questions when I'd finished. I don't think that went down well, because they didn't ask me any questions at the end. In the meeting afterwards, Petro didn't stick to the agenda. The government had just announced a new tax policy, and they spent most of the time discussing this and getting quite emotional. At times, they raised their voices to each other. I was really shocked. It was late in the afternoon when Pedro was ready to talk about the first item on the agenda. But I had to leave, as I'd arranged an appointment with someone at the embassy. I apologized that I had to rush off. Pedro just said to me, You know, Sven, meetings in our country can last a long time. Then he put his arm around my shoulder and said, You must come to dinner tomorrow night at my home. My wife is a wonderful cook. So that was it. Did you enjoy the meal? It was a lovely meal, and they made me very welcome. But I'm not sure I can work with Pedro. He's a nice guy, but our ways of doing business are so different. I felt constantly frustrated during the visit. And after going all that way, I don't feel I accomplished anything. Unit 10 Ethics. Track 25. 1. Bribery and corruption. 2. Price fixing. 3. Environmental pollution. 4. Sex discrimination. 5. Insider trading. 6. Tax fraud. 7. Counterfeit goods. 8. Money laundering. 9. Animal testing. 10. Industrial espionage. Unit 10. Ethics. Track 26. Earthwatch is an international research and conservation 
an education organization. And we have over 100 field research projects around the world. That involves uh, scientists looking at how animals and plants are coping in their natural environment. So the, all these 100 projects are supported from offices that we have in the US, in the UK, in India, in Melbourne, and in Japan and China. And the purpose of our work is to provide the scientific data about what's happening to animal and plants in the world as climate change and as human population expands and as the environment is degraded. All our field research projects are designed in a way that members of the public, company employees, teachers, youth, young scientists can join our researchers in the field as field assistants and collect real data that is contributing to understanding what is happening. Unit 10. Ethics. Track 27. What role can corporate sponsors play in helping the environment? Well, companies have a huge role to play. Uh, our global economy is based on the companies operating and producing goods and services that we consume. So fundamentally businesses need to change the way they operate in order to help and, and reduce the environmental impact of their operations. I think many companies are able to, to set leading examples, to innovate uh, and to find new solutions to the environmental problems we have. So um, most people in the world work for a company, so the opportunity for companies to educate and engage their employees and get their employees inspired and motivated to do something in their own communities or in their workplace with respect to the environment is, is a big opportunity that, that Earthwatch certainly believes in and Earthwatch works with many companies to try and promote environmental change and then promote good practice so that those leading companies can then influence other companies to follow and also influence government. Unit 10. Ethics. Track 28. So for example, we work with HSBC, the global bank, on a climate partnership which is in collaboration with other key conservation organizations such as WWF and the Smithsonian Institute. And through that we're providing a learning opportunity online for every single HSBC employee around the world and also setting up five climate change research centers around the world and 2,000 HSBC employees over the next five years will join our field researchers in India, in Brazil, in the US, in the UK and in China to carry out data collection to understand how forests are, are, are coping with climate change and what is happening and what, 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 how animals and plants are being affected. So that's a very important program and it's a very important way of getting company employees involved in our work, understanding what the issues are and then taking that back into their workplace uh, and becoming, we call them climate champions, ambassadors for, for, for environmental change so that they can then influence their colleagues and also the way that HSBC operates as a business. So that's an example of a very important program for us um, and a demonstration of how a company can, um, can and should make a difference in terms of these issues. Unit 10. Ethics. Track 29. There have been a number of cases of resume dishonesty in the papers recently. That's right. And unfortunately, it happened to a really good friend of mine. Oh? What happened? Well, she got a really good job. Head of sales at a prestigious company. She was over the moon. Everything was going really well. She was getting on with all her sales staff. She was receiving strong performance reviews, and she was exceeding all her sales targets. She was getting a bit of a reputation as a rising star. Then suddenly, after four years in the job, her company fired her. Was it her CV? Yeah. 
She had lied on it. She had claimed she had a master's degree, and she had also made up a fictitious previous employer. Do you know why she had done it? She said she had felt desperate because she had been unemployed for a few months. And how did they find out? An HR initiative. It required employees to show all college transcripts, and they found out she didn't have a master's degree after all. It wasn't the lack of the degree that cost her her job; it was her dishonesty. Since then, I've advised everyone to be honest on their CV. Unit Ten, Ethics, Track Thirty. Okay, let's talk about Tom. We all know he's become a real problem,、mm. and we can't turn a blind eye to what's going on any longer. He's sending in sales reports saying he's met various customers, and we find out it's not true. <laughs> and worst of all, he's putting in expense claims we know to be false. He claims he's had meals with customers, and then we find out they haven't met him for ages. These are serious matters. We can't ignore them, but also he's upsetting the other people in the department. They say he's really rude and uncooperative, a real nightmare to work with. Yeah, the problem is he's a really good salesman.、Hmm. In fact, he was our top salesman last year. But I agree, he needs tighter control. He isn't behaving professionally, and he's not being a good team player. We can't let it go on. Exactly, but what are we going to do about it?、Hmm. It won't be easy. He's a really difficult character, incredibly independent. He hates rules and regulations. I'd say there are two ways we could deal with this. We could have a chat with him about his sales reports. Also, we could mention that we're checking all expense claims very carefully in the future. If we do that, he may come to his senses and start behaving professionally. Or we could take a strong approach: tell him if he doesn't change his ways, we'll be sending him a warning letter, and that could lead to him being dismissed. What do you think? Hmm. Both those options have advantages, but if we just have a friendly chat with him, he may not take it seriously.、Mm. To be honest, I doubt whether he'll change much with that approach. But if we take a firm approach, there's a risk he may get upset and look for another job. We don't want that either. No, we certainly don't want to lose him.、Mm. Okay, let's look at it from another angle. I'm wondering if he has personal problems and they're affecting his work. Why don't we have a friendly talk with him and find out if that's the real problem? He might respond well to that approach. Hmm. Maybe you're right. It might be the best way to deal with the problem. One thing's for sure: he's a brilliant salesman, and he's making a load of money for us. So we certainly don't want to lose him unless we have to. Okay. Let's see if we can sort this out. I'll arrange for Tom to meet us. How about next Wednesday? Is that a good time? Okay with me. I'm free that morning. Unit Ten, Ethics, Track Thirty One. Ernesto, I've just had an interesting conversation with our head of research. She's been telling me about a new drug they've done some initial work on. It's for treating a disease which causes blindness. Oh yes, I've heard about that one. I think it's called river blindness or something like that.、Mm -hmm. Millions of Africans are dying from it every year. Most of the people at risk are poor and can't afford expensive medicines to treat the disease. Anyway, it seems that the drug we're working on has had very promising results. It could well provide a cure for the disease. That's good news.、Mm. So, how much money is needed to put it on the market, and what's the time scale? Well, that's the problem. It'll cost about a hundred million dollars to develop the drug. And it'll probably take ten years or so to bring it to the market. Hmm, that's a lot of money to invest. Hmm, is it worth it? Well, that's the question. Should we spend that amount on a drug which will certainly help our image, but may not make us much money? 
I mean, most of the people suffering from the disease probably won't have enough money to pay a realistic price for the drug. I see. So the question is, should we spend time, money, and resources on a drug which may not make us much money? Mm. Of course, we'll probably get some financial help in the beginning, a subsidy of some kind, but developing the drug is bound to require a huge investment on our part. Yes, that's the problem. And remember, we're not a charity. The bottom line is we're in business to make money. Exactly. Anyway, we'll be hearing more about this one, because I see it's the first item on the agenda for next week's management meeting. Let's see what the others have to say about it. Unit 11. Leadership. Track 32. What are the qualities of a good business leader? I'm going to highlight five um, areas which I think are, are important, and I don't think that they are as complicated as many people believe. The first that I would highlight is um, a sense of direction. A business leader needs to know where they're planning to go to and how they're planning to get there. The second point I would want to highlight is courage. You need to have the courage to understand um, when to make the, the right decision and, and how to, to push yourself forward, otherwise indecisiveness floods in. Thirdly, communication, um, because without that you, you have no ability to take people with you um, and there's no point at all in, in plotting a course, arriving there and finding that you've left the troops behind. The next point that I would highlight is respect the communication of the people that you are um, working with and the respect that you have, whether those are people within the, the top level of individuals or indeed other people lower down within the organisation, is very important in order to, to take people with you and to carry everything through. The last point that I would highlight is emotional intelligence and that's the sensitivity that you have with the people around you so that you are able to um, understand where they are in the organization, how they behave in the way that they do within the organization, and yet have the, um, the coldness of head to be able to bring the shutters down if you need to. Unit 11, Leadership, Track 33. Do you think great business leaders are born or made? Well, there's a, um, it's a very big question that. Uh, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that there are natural born leaders in life. And, and yet equally, there is, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that one can learn a great number of those skills. What I would say is that when um, you're competing against a natural born leader. The person who has acquired the skills will, I think, fail every time. And the things that a natural born leader possesses um, are things like charisma, um, intelligence, the ability to influence other people. Those are very difficult skills to learn. Um, and I think it's perhaps interesting as an anecdote um, to say that I believe 20 of the first 23 astronauts in America were all first born. Um, now, it may be a huge coincidence, but my, um, my sense is that it probably isn't a coincidence and there is something about uh, natural born leaders which, as I say, can, can be learnt from and people can improve their skill set, but they're unlikely to compete and win against them. Unit 11. Leadership. Track 34. Which leaders have impressed or influenced you and why? And the first of them is, is actually my husband. Um, I've been privileged um, to, to share a, a business life um, alongside a home life. And my husband is a few years older than me and therefore has paved the way, if you like, um, in terms of, of his business successes. But what I've seen in him 
um, is, a, is a tremendous tenacity and the ability to fight like a cornered rat when he needs to. And that's, that's really rare um, and very, very powerful when you see it. Um, I also see in him the ability to, um, to strike a chord with people um, just by walking in the room. He, he possesses um, a level of natural um, leadership and, and, and power, if you like. He also has um, an, an innate ability for inspired thinking. He works ahead of the pack, um, and I've learned a lot from that. So I probably am not a natural-born leader, but I have learned an awful lot of skills from the, the likes of the individuals that I've worked with, particularly my husband. And his um, strategic thinking and being able to uh, work outside the box, I think, has been very, very powerful. Unit 11. Leadership. Track 35. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming to my presentation. I know you're all very busy, so I'll be as brief as possible. <coughs> OK, then. I'm going to talk about our new range of rackets, which we are selling under the brand name Excel. I'll tell you about the test launch we carried out in Croatia a few weeks ago. I'm going to divide my presentation into four parts. First, I'll give you some background to the launch. After that, I'll tell you how things went during the launch. Next, I'll assess its effectiveness. Finally, I'll outline our future plans for the product. <clears throat> I'll be glad to answer any questions at the end of my talk. Right, let's start with some background about the launch. As you know, it's taken almost two years to develop the Excel range. The rackets are targeted at enthusiastic amateur players, and thanks to some technical innovations, Excel rackets give a player great control over their shots and more power. So, everyone who uses the racket should immediately improve their game. The rackets were thoroughly tested in focus groups and modifications were made to their design and appearance. OK, everyone? Yes, Manfred, you have a question. Yes, I... So, that's the background. Right, let's move on to the test launch. How successful was it? Well, in two words, highly successful. We think the racket will be a winner. If you look at the graph, you'll see the racket's actual sales compared with forecast sales. Quite a difference, isn't there? The sales were 20% higher than we predicted. In other words, a really impressive result. Well above all our expectations. The results show that we got the pricing right and it suggests the Excel range will make a big impact nationwide. <clears throat> to sum up, a very promising test launch. I believe the new range of rackets has tremendous potential in the market. Right, where do we go from here? Obviously, we'll move on to stage two and have a multimedia advertising and marketing campaign. In a few months' time, you'll be visiting our customers and taking a lot of orders, I hope, for the new rackets. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Unit 12. Competition. Track 36. Can you tell us about the work of the Competition Commission? The Competition Commission is a public body which carries out investigations into particular mergers and markets in the UK as well as other matters related to what they call the regulated industries um, such as uh, water and energy and the communications sector. One of our most high profile investigations at the moment is one we're carrying out into the ownership of airports in the United Kingdom. Currently seven of the UK airports are owned by a company called BAA, 
that's the British Airports Authority. Um, we've been asked to look into the, that, their ownership of those airports and whether that ownership structure is in the interests of consumers or whether uh, an injection of greater competition uh, would benefit the users of those airports. Unit 12. Competition. Track 37. In some business sectors there may be very few competitors. How can you ensure fairness in such cases? It's actually a matter of not so, many, not so much looking at the number of competitors or providers in a particular market so much as looking at the dynamics of that market. It's equally possible for what you could describe as a concentrated market, one with say just three or four major suppliers or providers, um, to be very competitive, but equally so you can have a market with the same level of concentration, the same number of players, um, which is relatively static. There's very little competition going on between the players. Customers aren't switching and the companies concerned aren't reacting with each other in, in the way that you'd like to in a competitive market. For example, one of our recent inquiries was into the groceries market in the UK. Um, that is quite a highly concentrated market in the sense that there are sort of four or five major grocery companies in this country um, and they control something in the region of 80% of the market. However, um, our, after in-depth investigation it was clear that this is a market where these companies are competing actively with each other. Um, customers have a choice and they're exercising that choice and as a result the companies concerned are competing with each other which brings the benefits in terms of um, lower prices, innovation and greater choice for consumers. Unit 12. Competition. Track 38. We could contrast that with another inquiry that we did, completed about two years ago, into what's known as liquid petroleum gas for domestic users. Essentially this is for customers who are not supplied for energy through pipes, they, they live in remote areas and therefore they need the gas, which is also known as propane, propane delivered to their house and put in a tank. Again, this is a market with only four major players in it, concentrated in the same way in nominal terms like the groceries industry, but we found a far more static market. Uh, we found that customers were not switching between the companies, the companies were not competing with each other, um, and consequently we're finding higher prices, less innovation and less choice. Unit 12. Competition. Track 39. OK. Perhaps we could start, as we agreed, by discussing the kind of relationship we want. OK. Usually, with a major distributor or agent, we don't offer an exclusive agency agreement because they don't want it. They like to use and distribute the products of most of the top companies. They make more money that way. Yes, a non-exclusive contract would be perfect for us too. As you know, we represent many famous brands and will be happy to add your product lines to our list. Right. Now, prices. We like to recommend the prices for each overseas market. We advise on minimum and the maximum prices for each of our models. No, that's no good for us. We prefer to set the prices for all the products we offer. We know the market conditions far better than you. We would set the correct prices to maximize profits, of course. OK. It is not really a problem if you prefer it that way. I won't argue with you. Now, the commission. I suggest a rate of 15% uh, on all the revenue you obtain, either directly or indirectly. Is that OK? 15% is too low. We want at least 20%. The market is very competitive. We'll have to spend a lot on advertising and promoting your products. Yes, but uh, we could help with this. How much will you pay us? Well, 
we might go 50-50 up to an agreed limit. We can talk about uh, exact figures later. I'll have to think about it. Uh, we'll talk about the commission later. Let's discuss the length of the contract. Normally, we offer two years. And uh, to be honest, with the new distributor, we prefer a shorter period. Either side can terminate with 60 days notice. Well, it must be at least three years for it to be profitable for us. Well, we can talk about it later. I suggest we break it for lunch now. Unit 12. Competition. Track 40. 1. A non-exclusive contract would be perfect for us, too. 2. No, that's no good for us. 3. We know the market conditions far better than you. 4. I suggest a rate of 15% uh, on all the revenue you obtain. 5. 15% is too low. We want at least 20%. 6. We could help with this. 7. How much will you pay us? 8. We'll talk about the commission later. 9. To be honest, with the new distributor, we prefer a shorter period. 10. It must be at least three years. Working across cultures. 4. Communication styles. Track 41. How close do you like to be when speaking with a business colleague? How much eye contact are you comfortable with? Are you comfortable with long periods of silence? And how do you feel about interruptions? These are some of the questions we will be looking at in today's workshop on communication styles and cultural awareness. My name's Patrick Keane, and I'm the managing director of our office in Caracas, Venezuela. So why should you listen to me? Well, I've had 12 overseas postings, including Brazil, Russia, China, and India, and I speak four languages. By the end of the workshop today, you'll have a better understanding of communication styles in your own culture and an introduction to those styles in other cultures. And this is the starting point for learning how to deal with cultural differences. It's worth bearing in mind that 60% of people in this company get an overseas posting. Let me tell you briefly what we are going to cover today. I'll get the workshop going with a brief talk. Firstly, I'm going to talk about some ways in which we use verbal communication, and I look at two areas. Then I'm going to look at nonverbal communication, again, looking at two areas. And after that, we'll do some activities, looking at communication styles in your own culture. Let me ask you a question. Can you put up your hands if you've already had an overseas posting? Thank you. Now, we know that the majority of you will have an overseas posting at some time in your career. One of the challenges we face when we go into a new cultural environment is the communication style. I'm going to begin with verbal communication. My first example is silence and how comfortable people are with silence. When people don't say anything. East Asian and Arab cultures are generally quite comfortable with silence. However, Anglo-Saxon cultures don't feel happy with long pauses in the conversation. My second example is the acceptance of interruption between speakers. This is seen differently among different cultures. Generally, we can say that East Asians, Americans, and Northern Europeans are not comfortable with interruption. They prefer to have as few interruptions as possible during conversations. Now, I'm not saying that people in these cultures don't interrupt. However, in these cultures, people who interrupt frequently are regarded as rude. 
But if we look at Southern Europeans and Latin American cultures, well, they're quite comfortable with interruptions. They even see it as positive engagement. They can see cultures which remain quiet as being rather formal or cold. Let me move on to nonverbal communication, body language and gestures, which can provide challenges for staff not used to working abroad. Again, I have two examples. First, I want to talk about proximity, or how close you stand when talking to people. Now, this really does vary between cultures. There's been some research into this, and apparently East Asian cultures prefer the space between people in conversation to be approximately one meter. However, the Latin cultures of Europe and Latin America, they prefer less than half a meter. This can cause some strange situations where people from different cultures try to get comfortable during the conversation by moving forwards or backwards. As I said earlier, I'm based in Caracas, Venezuela. In fact, Venezuelans like to talk to each other standing about 12 centimeters apart. And they like to touch each other to show trust or to show that the other person is what they call simpatico. My second example of nonverbal communication is the level of eye contact, how much eye contact is normal and when to break it. Some cultures may feel that the other side is not engaging with them and not showing enough eye contact. Other cultures may feel that they are being stared at. Well, Arab and Latin cultures usually have the most eye contact, while East Asians have the least. North Americans and Northern Europeans are somewhere in the middle. Before we move on to the workshop, I'd like to ask you which cultures you feel you know well.